huge contingent from the Black Housewives League have arrived and we'd just like to let them take their seats and then we'll resident and she will be introducing the guest speaker. Thank you. She has correctly pointed out to me that she's first going to welcome you all. Thank you. I don't know. I'm sure I'm... If you don't hear me, let me speak louder. I'm sure I'm heard. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all to this two-day conference, which has been co-organized by the National Black Consumer Union, the Black Housewives League of South Africa, the Free Market Foundation of South Africa, Housewives League of South Africa, and the South African National Consumer Union. We are all consumers, groups, and whatever the size or approach of each one of us, we exist because there are problems to be solved. <laughs> Indeed, in South Africa, with all the problems resulting from apartheid, unequal and inferior services for blacks, exploitation of black consumers in the marketplace due to ignorance and discrimination. The impact of the National Black Consumer Union will be far greater on the black people. The theme of this conference is consumer power in a free market. For two days you will be addressed by experts on various topics such as the consumer and the law, the economics of consumer power, and so on. We the organizers of this conference, coming from our respective organizations, believe that consumers must be empowered. <clears throat> and we can only have that power through education. The National Black Consumer Union's major goal is to educate consumers and acquaint them with the many aspects of consumerism, to enable them to exercise their rights and have resources for redress against unfair trade practices and an avenue for input into legislative policy making processes. I hope at, this, at the end of this conference, we will come up with clear cut resolutions which will enable the consumer, the consumer's power to be felt and heard in all policy making structures of our country. I'd like to welcome you all to this conference and I would like to thank our sponsors which you'll find listed at the back of your uh, programs. Thank them heartily for having made it, this conference a possibility. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce to you today, this morning, our main keynote speaker. She is Miss Suda Shinoi. Uh, she is a native of India, presently is a tutor in economics at the University of Newcastle, New South Wales in Australia. Uh, you will read about her profile in, at the back of your programs. So without much ado, Suda, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Madam Chairman and friends. Uh, it gives me very great pleasure indeed to be the opening speaker at this conference. And I should like to take this opportunity to say how grateful I am to the two people who were most responsible, Mr. Eustace Davy and Ms. Nancy Sages, the Free Market Foundation very grateful for the opportunity to come here. Now, I should like to take as the text of what I'm going to say, text to which I shall speak, two propositions. The first proposition, consumption is the sole end and aim of all production. The second proposition follows from the first, and that proposition is, the interest of the producer should be attended to only to the extent necessary to promote the interests of the consumer. I should like to develop both of these ideas a little further. Consumption is the sole end and aim of all production. Now that is a statement of fact. That is the fact. It see, may seem obvious, but what follows perhaps is a little less obvious. What we are saying if we say that consumption is the sole end and aim of all production is that we can explain the activities of producers, shopkeepers, factory owners, farmers, lawyers, and so on, only by looking to the needs and requirements of those who purchase these goods and services, in other words, the consumers. Lawyers don't write contracts just for themselves. They write contracts for all their customers, all those who come to purchase their services. <coughs> Shopkeepers stock goods for those who wish to buy from them. Factory owners and factory workers produce clothing TV sets, shoes, toys, and so on, not for themselves, but for those who buy from them for eventual sale to consumers, in other words, to their fellow workers. Even the president of Nissan or General Motors doesn't produce cars for himself and his friends. He produces for the millions of people who buy his products all around the world. Okay, how do we explain this happening? How does this happen? As I said, we begin with the obvious, we go on to ask how this happens. Do we get a personal interview with the president of Nissan and tell him, you know, we want a car, this is the sort of car we'd like? The shopkeeper, does he sort of march out with a shotgun and say, come and buy from me or else? The answer, of course, is that for all producers, from the smallest shopkeeper, to the chief executive of the largest multinational corporation. In all cases, the returns that they get, their incomes, are obtained by successfully producing what their customers are willing to buy. I should like to stress that, the willingness to purchase. By buying some goods and services, and by refusing to buy 
other goods and services, customers determine the incomes that producers get. Producers do not make profits by deciding they will make profits. They make profits if and only if they produce what their customers want to buy. A number of years ago, this lesson was learnt very painfully by some of the largest corporations in the world, the American motor producers, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Chrysler Corporation. They learnt very painfully that whatever is produced is not necessarily sold. It all depends on whether consumers will buy what they actually do produce. Okay, so the producer may wish to make a profit. It is the consumer who determines whether, in fact, he does make that profit. If consumers refuse to buy, what we get are losses. Failure to produce what consumers want results in losses. Okay, the consumers, who are they? Consumers who determine what producers get. Ordinary housewives. The other day, I uh, had lunch with a uh, number of black housewives in Soweto, and we all agreed on one thing. It doesn't matter what color the man is, his shape or size, whether he's a university professor or a dustman, no man knows the price of anything. It's the housewives who do the buying. The only safe way to let a man shop is to give him a list and clear orders on what to do and what not to do. Otherwise, chaos. Okay, the ordinary consumer then is a housewife, but the housewife does not shop for herself, she shops for her family. She knows directly what their needs and requirements are. She knows which child will have cocoa pops and which child will not touch them with a 10-foot pole. She, but she shops, therefore, to meet their needs and requirements. It is their needs and requirements which determine what she buys, which therefore determines what producers must ultimately produce. As one economist put it, every infant who buys one toy, plays with one toy, and refuses another toy, puts his vote into the consumer basket. Okay, now, consumers, in other words, control producers. They determine what is produced, when it is produced, how much is produced. They do this because it is consumer purchasing and refusal to purchase, which results in profits and losses to producers. Okay, now, producers, of course, are not always entirely happy with this situation. It would be very much nicer for them if they had a captive market, if they were freed from this market discipline, if they didn't have the fear of losses. If consumers were unable to go to alternate producers to get what they required. If we go back to the example I used originally, great motor companies in the US and gigantic monoliths of the capitalist world with incomes larger than the national incomes of many underdeveloped countries. How did they escape from the losses which were imposed on them by consumers? They escaped from these losses only because the American government came to their rescue. So long as the common law prevailed, there was nothing these capitalist corporations could do about the losses that were being imposed on them. The American government came to their rescue by putting quotas on supply of the alternate cars that customers were purchasing and by providing subsidies one way or the other. Okay, so that's the American government protected producers against the verdict of the consumers. Against the verdict of the consumers who expressed their verdict by refusing to buy these cars. Okay, now what this example shows is that Import restrictions, such as tariffs and other similar government interventions, act against 
the consumer interest. <coughs> Tariffs and import restrictions prevent consumers from buying from cheaper producers, the goods they would actually like to buy. A tariff and import restriction is therefore vicious. If it isn't vicious, it's unnecessary. If the goods were cheaper, they would be purchased. The reason why you have the tariff and the restriction is precisely because the alternate goods are not desired by consumers. What tariffs and import restrictions do is protect producers against consumers. And this is true whatever country one is looking at, whatever period of time one is looking at. It's always the case. Without tariffs, consumers would buy cheaper goods, better quality goods, and they would be better off. You would have consumer power. Nationalized industries, another example, nationalized industries such as electricity, gas, and so forth are found again in all countries, in most times and periods. Nationalized industries cannot be controlled ultimately by consumers cannot be controlled because they cannot go out of business as a result of losses. It is the fear of loss which ultimately is the final control on the producer. Nothing concentrates the mind so wonderfully as the prospect of being hanged. Okay. Consumer requirements then are met by producers as a result of operation under the common law and as a result of actual or potential losses. If you have a loss, you know the market is working. Now, this does not mean, of course, that the goods we buy are sort of tailor-made to individual requirements. It does mean that goods and services meet the needs of a vast range of customers. Goods are adapted to meet their needs and requirements as circumstances change. If there is no adaptation, the goods aren't purchased, you have losses. Government intervention then in the common law is either unnecessary or vicious. It is vicious so long as it protects producers against consumers, against the verdict of consumers expressed in the refusal to buy. It is unnecessary since we have a common law framework which ensures that producers produce what consumers wish to buy and cannot force them to purchase what they produce. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any questions maybe you would like to ask uh, Ms. Chinoy, please note them and uh, there will be time for questions. Uh, I would like to say if you have questions, you can either write them and pass them on to the chair or you can show by raise of hand and move into the aisle, identify yourself and proceed with your questioning with your question. I'd like to introduce to you our second speaker, who is Mr. Leon Lu, who is a lawyer by profession. He is a founder man member of the executive director of the Free Market Foundation of South Africa, of Southern Africa. Leon and his wife, Frances Kendall, have, have have co-authored the number one bestseller, South Africa, The Solution, and its sequel, Let the People Govern. He and Francis are joint nominees for the 1989 Nobel Prize. He will speak on the topic, Restoring the Consumer's Common Law Rights. Mr. Liu.
Um, Madam Chair, it's an appropriate time, I think, to be having a conference of this title, uh, the consumer power in the free market, because not everyone is aware that there is indeed a global revolution occurring which makes a conference of this nature imperative. All over the world, in virtually every country, there is now a move towards free markets. That is, in the communist countries, throughout Africa, throughout Latin America, South America, Europe, everywhere, there is a disillusionment with the ability of governments, whoever and wherever, to improve the lot of people in general, and consumers in particular, wherever the government has tried to regulate for the benefit of consumers, there has been generally a counterproductive result. Shortages, distortions, discontent, <coughs> a limited range of products, higher prices, and long queues, of course. So all over the world there is now a trend back. All over the world it is realized that when things are in the hands of the state, they're in a hell of a state. <laughs> and we in South Africa now have these words, these new international buzzwords, and not everyone here realizes that we're actually latecomers on the scene. Words like deregulate, privatize, uh, words that did not exist privatized did not exist seven years ago. It's not in any dictionary. Deregulate, although it sort of existed, also is not in most dictionaries and really became a word all over the world in every language during the last five to ten years. So it's appropriate to think of what this means. It seems to be a tidal wave or a snowball which can't be stopped. And what is, where does it take us? Basically what it does is takes us back to the common law, which has already been referred to, and the common law all over the world is essentially the same. There are differences, but there are basic elements in common amongst common laws. Um, the other thing is that we in the free market movement are very happy at the moment, because in the early stages the tide was running against us, and now the tide is running for us. All sorts of people presumed we were somehow the representatives of big business trying to exploit consumers. I'm not sure in the foundation, because we don't check on this, but we suspect that the majority of our members are black. The business members are very few by number, and many of the big businesses some of you might think support us don't. And there are some that actively oppose us because they don't like free markets at all for the reasons you've heard from Sudar Shenon. Now, in my years as a lawyer, which I was before being at the Free Market Foundation, and since then, I've of course heard many, many, many complaints about things that go wrong for consumers. And virtually every time, close to 99% of the time, the complaint is about something that is perfectly adequately dealt with by the common law. It is one of two things. It is a complaint about fraud or a complaint about breach of contract. And when people think that the consumer is not being protected, in vert near to 100% of cases, the problem is not that the law doesn't provide for protection, but the problem is that it can't be enforced. The consumer doesn't have access to the law. The law is costly or inaccessible, or the procedures are inefficient. And frankly, the lawyers, of which I was one, have tied up a little cartel that makes the law very good for lawyers and very bad for everyone else. And that's one of the things that needs to be deregulated, in my view. But we might come to that, especially under Louise Tager's paper. Now, what is this common law? I don't want to go into the theory of it. But basically, in the Western countries, the common law, probably the father of the common law, was Hugo de Groot or Grotius, who was one of the great jurists, and many others, but influenced it in most of the Western countries, less so in Britain than in others, and our tradition is from the Roman Dutch law. And he described it as, in one case, as inborn reason of natural law, universal law. That's basically those things which everyone can take for granted. Common law is really that which you intuitively think the law should say. 
That normally is the common law. Not always, it's not perfect, but it comes pretty close to that and certainly developed at a time when that context would have made all of it or most of it that which you intuitively think is right. It has as its prime objective the importance of the individual to the extent that there are groups like churches or clubs or societies or maybe the word groups in South Africa has additional meanings uh, racial groups or whatever, the common law's concern is with the individual and the freedom of the individual might result in the individual associating in groups, but the common law promotes the individual above the group or the country or anyone else. Then an essential, the second essential ingredient is consent or informed consent, that is to whatever, whatever the individual consents to, the common law is in favour of. And that Consent is not informed, of course, if there's force or if there's fraud. Then the common law presumes that the individual will act prudently towards others. It is logical law, the fourth principle. That, again, as I said, which you would expect it to be. And then the fifth point, which is very, very important to remember, it is not morality. It is not the job of the law to prescribe morals. It is the job of the law to prescribe the behavior of people towards each other in respecting their rights. The common law's principle is that you are, have the right to be immoral, but not the right to violate someone else's rights. And then the sixth principle is sanctity of ownership, the great respect for the things you own, that you can do with them what you like, other than, of course, violate someone else's rights. Now, the common law is a great thing, and it's that thing which all of you expect that you have. You think you would like to have, and you think you have. But as it's been said in an article by Norman Davis, which I recommend to you in The Individualist, if any of you want it, I can supply you with copies. As he puts it, the common law in South Africa has now largely been overridden by statute law. And this is why it must be restored. It is that great, reasonable set of laws which would protect consumers in virtually all circumstances if it were restored and if it were accessible to the public. The first way of restoring it is to have efficient procedures, legal procedures so that every little consumer or every big consumer with a little problem, shall we say, can immediately have that, their rights protected and enforced. And that is the subject of Professor Tager's paper, and there's much already that has been done there in restoring common law by Professor Tager and others, especially her. She's one of South Africa's great heroes or heroines. I'm not sure which is the right one to say amongst traditional and liberated women. Um, but she really is and has done a great deal, and I think there's a lot more in the pipeline. Then, of course, a great innovation was the small claims courts but in my view, hopelessly inadequate. A beginning, but a small one. The jurisdiction of 2,000 Rand is just simply nowhere near enough. It doesn't cover a TV set. It doesn't cover, obviously, a motor car. It doesn't cover a lounge suite, and so on and so forth. It must be five or 10,000. It should be anything that the parties agree to. By consent, there should be no limit, in my view. Also, its power should be extended to have the right of interdict, to stop people doing wrong things, which should be accessible to ordinary people quickly. At the moment, only Supreme Courts can grant interdicts. And then, in my view, also, it should be changed so that ordinary people can represent each other. People who are lack confidence or don't know what they're doing or whatever should be able to use friends or relatives to represent them in small claims courts, and for that matter, lawyers. And then, uh, in my view, another power which they should have is to rectify agreements. Now, I checked out with the Consumer Council what typical complaints are. And one of the most common problems they face is that people discussed a certain agreement. They didn't read it. They signed it. And what they, in complete good faith and probably in bad, often, not probably, but often in bad faith by the seller, thought was in the agreement turns out not to be in there because they didn't read it or if they did they didn't understand it. So that one of the things I think should be done, which is very, very difficult in law, I don't want to go into that now, is that you can have agreements rectified at small claim courts if you can satisfy the court that the agreement does not reflect what was actually discussed or agreed to. 
these are some of the very, very inadequate or very serious limitations on small claims courts. Now, I want to divide what I have to say up into two sections, sorry, three main sections from here. Firstly, that which is not enforced and should be enforced through the improved procedures which Professor Tager will discuss. And then that which should be restored, that which has actually been taken away from consumers by law. And then finally, the role of education and services to consumers, which is really perhaps in the end the most important of all. Now, I said virtually, in terms of what should be enforced and is not, I said virtually all complaints I have ever heard amount to breach of contract or fraud or some other common law right which is not protected. And, um, for example, I was on a consumer debate once on the radio and somebody referred to a certain kind of soap which supposedly if you rub yourself with this, it takes away cellulite or fat. Uh, there's actually one in our house which is sort of rotten, rotting, which I presume, uh, and I, wa I wanted to bring it and then forgot. Uh, and he said this does not remove fat, and this should not be allowed on the shelves, and there should be a law against it. And I said, but there is a law against it, the law of fraud, and the law of breach of contract. If somebody sells you something saying it takes away cellulite and it doesn't, it's breach of contract and fraud. And uh, to make another law doesn't help you at all. And this is one of the great myths of consumer protection, is every time you encounter something unpleasant, you pass another law. But until you actually have a way of enforcing the law, the new law is as much of a waste of time as the common law was in the first place. And the simple answer is for somebody to prosecute the supplier. And in my view, that should be anybody. Class action, public interest actions, and all of these should be possible. No one... Ten years later has prosecuted the manufacturer of the soap. I still see the same ads, and for all I know, the soap does work. But let's establish whether it does or doesn't. Um, then the second most common complaint is quality of service, quality of products, products that don't do what they're supposed to do, repairs that aren't done properly. Again, this is already covered by the law. To make new laws doesn't give the consumer more rights or more protection. Indeed, what it does, it takes our attention away from what's needed, and that is to enforce the common law. And to get rid of all the costs and obstacles that consumers have to having their rights protected. Then there's a third group of complaints that have arisen in the Consumer Council, and those are really communication problems, where, for example, someone points out to the manufacturer that a certain size of socks isn't available, it was a recent one, or that overalls are too short for the people who wear them. Apparently it turns out we have overalls that are made according to the design of Chinese people or Taiwanese people and they have to be worn by African people and so they're too short. So what's required is for somebody to go along and point this out to the supplier. These complaints are not complaints that revolve around law but complaints that revolve around communication of supply and demand. Complaints about packaging that doesn't say what's in the product. This is the role of consumer bodies and consumers to see that these are attended to, and usually the suppliers are very happy to do so. The Consumer Council points out to me that the vast majority of transactions, one presumes, have happy consumers and suppliers. Millions of transactions every day where everyone apparently is happy. In the six months up to now, there have been 16,400 complaints in 30 categories, uh, subdivided into a further 28, making 50, uh, 58 categories. Most of these complaints, 50% of them, related to housing pools and paving, that's 20%, cars, parts and repairs, that's 17%, electric, electrical appliances and repairs of electrical appliances, Plants is 14%, total of 15.6,6. Now, what are these? Well, it turns out that the main complaints are quality of homes, pools, and paving. It's inadequate quality in every single case, a breach of contract. Common law covers it, we need no extra law. The second is not keeping time, not finishing on time. Again, breach of contract, all we need is consumers to be able to enforce their contracts quickly, cheaply, and efficiently. <clears throat> then the other one, which is an information problem, 
is that they often sign agreements without understanding what they say. For example, people rich enough to buy swimming pools will agree to progress payments 40% on completion of digging the hole when it's only 20% of the work done, or whatever. Now that might be being misled by the contractor, in which case there should be a recourse to rectification, or the consumer just agrees to pay according to a certain progress for whatever the consumer does, so. but that's got nothing to do with law. Then with cars <coughs> and repairs and parts, complaints relate to overcharging for repairs, and I complain about that regularly. The solution again is for consumers to agree to the price in advance. I get quotes for my car repairs. The mechanics look absolutely nonplussed. They're just not used to people wanting to know what their side of the deal is. They assume they will determine my side of the deal after they've done, done the job, how much I pay. I want to know in advance. Uh, then there's suspicion that they do repairs that aren't really done. Again, the law already covers that. You can't have another law restricting them to what they have to do. We must enforce the law correctly. And so it goes. I'm going to cut short over there and finish, uh, not go on with this discussion, but just to assure you that every single issue that comes up in the consumer council's complaints they receive, and I'm not saying they're all the complaints or representative of everybody's complaints, all sorts of communities might not go to them, but nonetheless, in every single one it was either a matter, according to them and a the common sense, that relates to communication between consumers and suppliers, or existing laws that are not adequately protected. You can work through them one by one, and they are the overwhelming bulk of all complaints and problems. Now, I went into the whole question of shoes, furniture, clothing, mail order complaints, dry cleaning, that's not properly done and so on. <coughs> now what rights must be restored? The second main point. Those are the ones that exist that are not properly enforced. Uh, but now what must be restored? <coughs> Firstly, the right of contract. And here a great delusion hit the world. It was believed, for example, that you help consumers by having strict credit and interest rate controls, HP laws and so on. Now very simply, what laws do when they restrict credit and interest is they divert capital from the poor and the high-risk borrowers to the rich and the low-risk borrowers. In other words, the only way poor people can get credit or capital is to compete with rich people by paying more, by compensating the lender for the fact that there's a higher risk. So what these laws have done, and they've always been lobbied for by the rich for very good reasons, is to penalize the poor and benefit the rich, that is to penalize most consumers and benefit least. For example, my gardener has a building society savings book in which he gets artificially low interest because of interest rate controls. I have a bond from the building society, so I am borrowing my gardener's money at artificially cheap and subsidized rates in order to live in luxury in northern Johannesburg and employ my gardener who is too poor to get credit anywhere. So he has to be a saver. So all this does is it benefits the relatively rich at the expense of the relatively poor. And that is what all interest rate controls do. So we have to get rid of them to make credit and capital available again to the poor. Then the, we have to allow cheap products back onto the market, especially in South African circumstances. That is to say, get rid of minimum quality and minimum standard controls, which raise the price. There are no benefits without costs. Minimum standards price goods out of the market for the poor. And there are many, many examples of this. There is a trade-off between risk and quality on the one hand and price on the other, and that's unavoidable. To give an example, in America they had a bizarre incident of raising quality, which is they required all retreaded tires to be registered to protect consumers against bad retreaded tires. The program lasted for eight years, cost $21 million to administer, plus all the millions of dollars spent by consumers and traders. During the period, seven tires were returned, which meant it cost $3 million per tire. This is typical of these measures, typical. It, time and time again, it's the same. Then subsidies, incidentally. A lot of people think subsidies help consumers. And... Uh, I did some studies in South Africa, for example, on buses, and the most heavily subsidized buses have the highest bus fares. There is a direct correlation 
the higher the subsidy, the higher the cost to the consumer. Not only that, but the biggest subsidies are in the richest communities. The buses in Waterkloof and Rosebank for whites have the biggest subsidies of all buses in South Africa. The buses serving the poorest people have the lowest subsidies and the lowest fares. So maybe the poor are fortunate that nobody's subsidizing their buses as much as the rich. But the notion that subsidies go to the poor is another giant myth. Subsidies on bread do not go to the poor but to the rich. They do not go to the consumer but to the producer of bread. Every time you look at every subsidy, you will find the product costs more and the rich benefit. And um, my time is nearly up, but I just want to explain why. A subsidy is, in effect, a percentage of the cost. If you think about it, it's got to be that in the end. So where the supplier is subsidized, it is in the self-interest of the supplier to maximize cost and inefficiency. Where it's not subsidized, it's in the self-interest to maximize efficiency and minimize cost. And so it goes. Price controls end up, in the long term, reducing the, the, the range and creating shortages. And uh, then the final comments I have are on the education of consumers and services. Now, firstly, time and time again, when it is not something already covered by common law, you find that the consumer signed something without reading it, or the consumer acted on the spur of the moment irresponsibly, and I do that regularly. One of the costs of being free, of having freedom as a consumer, is risk. And you cannot have choice without risk. So long as you can choose between A and B, you can make the wrong decision. And so a very, very important thing for free consumers, that is consumers with the best range of products, the best protection, and the best prices available in the world is that they make mistakes. They pay school fees. And the sooner consumers make mistakes, preferably as children, the better to learn to be good consumers. Consumers need not only to be educated and informed and inform themselves, but of course to take advice and get services which are available to them. I hope that I've put a case superficially in the short time available for why the con common law is the best law for consumers, why its restoration is imperative anyway because it's part of a global revolution, why it's good news for consumers that this is so, and why consumers can and should take advantage of it. I've also tried to just indicate some of the multitude of consumer rights that have been removed by statute law, many, many more that should be restored, and we can discuss, we can have a seminar on its own just on, that, on a list of perhaps 500 statutes that have removed consumer rights that should be restored. And also then a case for saying that what we really need desperately is a system whereby consumers are really protected instead of this endless bluffing of consumers by passing new laws that repeat the law that's already there anyway, the common law, and provide the consumer with no greater access to protection or the law. Uh, I just, I'm going to just quote something before I finish from Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader, the uh, best known consumerist in the world, had this to say, long ago already in 1968. I originally came to Washington with a great deal of hope that the regulatory agencies would champion the consumer's interests, but it didn't take me very long to become disillusioned. Nobody seriously challenges the fact that the regulatory agencies have made an accommodation with the businesses they are supposed to regulate, and that they have done so at the expense of the public. That is very, very important to realize. Every time you think you're regulating the people who supply the consumers, they have the money, they have the lobbies, and they have the sophistication to turn the measure against consumers. It happens time and time again. The consumers best off getting back to the good old-fashioned common law with methods of seeing that it's properly enforced. Madam Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Lou. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are jotting down your questions uh, because we are going to move on to the next speaker. I have the pleasure to introduce to you all this morning, Professor Louis Tager is an executive officer of the Law Review Project, a legal resource funded by the private sector and dedicated to bringing about a just legal system in South Africa. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Bachelor of Laws degree from University of the Versus Rand. Um, and a Master of Laws degree from Harvard University in the United States. She is a former Dean of the Law Faculty at Wits. This morning, she will speak on the topic, reducing the cost of access to the law, Professor. Thank you, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen. In recent years, there has been much talk about deregulation and its positive effect on economic development and job creation. Not enough emphasis has been placed on the positive effect of deregulation and indeed of a free market system on the consumer. We have neglected this aspect when in fact it is a paramount factor in a free enterprise system, the consumer is the ultimate beneficiary. He has the benefit of a better variety of goods, more competitive prices, more points of supply, the freedom to choose where he will buy, and most importantly, with deregulation, his job and business opportunities will increase and consequently, so will his spending power. The consumer is an all-powerful force. All these benefits exist in a free economy, but in the process of deregulation and opening the economy, consumer awareness has to be increased. The consumer has to be better educated and has to be made a more discerning person. I would recommend to consumer groups that the street law on consumerism be promoted. And I should remind you too of the common law principle, let the purchaser beware. Similarly, let the signer beware. I think people forget about that. There is a popular belief that much more legislation is needed to protect the consumer. I am not in any way convinced that such legislation will achieve this objective. Protective legislation creates a false sense of security. It gives the impression that all is under control. The consumer is then taken off his guard because he relies on the statute instead of his own good sense. I've come to feel, particularly in more recent times, that legislation is for the innocent, law-abiding man or woman, and I'm not a feminist, so I'll talk about man in the general sense of the word. The fraudulent, deceitful, wrongdoers ignore the law and act outside of it and in disregard of the law, whatever the law. The sanction for disobeying legislation is almost always a criminal penalty. Legislation creates statutory penalties and punishes them. It seldom redresses the civil law rights of the person harmed. The individual may feel satisfied that justice has been done because somebody's been sentenced or charged criminally. But that is cold comfort when losses and damages have been suffered. The controls enacted in legislation and recently I looked at the Share Blocks Control Act in some instance, and I found that these controls are not policed. Any contravention of such act entitles the aggrieved party to lay a criminal charge. 
But what about his losses? His lack of investment. He still has to fall back on his common law rights and sue for breach. The Credit Agreements Act provides for a cooling off period after the conclusion of certain contracts initiated by an uninvited salesman at a person's home. The Act covers only a few transactions and only goods that have been purchased on credit. There is no logical explanation behind the goods selected except past experience, you know, the case of the encyclopedia salesman. The Credit Agreements Act allows people to cancel certain contracts within a few days, and this is called the cooling off period. Now one might ask, why should we stop here? Let us include cash sales, not only credit sales. Why not include other goods, not just the limited class? Let us also include immovable property. In fact, if we include all contracts of sale wherever included, at our, in our consumer protection enthusiasm, we would then have reached the absurd position, and what is more, we would have destroyed the fundamental basis of the sanctity of contracts, on which our entire common law of contract rests. This is the cornerstone, and the cornerstone would collapse. There are other ways to address the needs of the consumer, other than through legislation and administrative procedures. But I'd just like to mention that people are very trusting, very gullible, and they're easily misled in all walks of life, rich, poor, educated, and uneducated. The consumer's hope rests not on legislation and administrative controls, but through the judicial system. The consumer must have access to the courts and to the legal profession. Now, it has been said that our courts, like the Carlton Hotel, are open to all. Of course, this expression didn't originate in South Africa. It arose in England, and the reference was to the Ritz Hotel, but the principle is just the same. Now, there's one problem. How many South Africans can afford the luxury of a five-star hotel? Our courts may be open to all, but the cost of litigation is so high, one single day, even in the magistrate's court, costs at least 1,000 rand. And one day in the Supreme Court can cost 4,000 rand and more. In truth, our courts are only open to those who can afford the luxury. <clears throat> as I said, as the process of deregulation gains momentum, as the number of legislative controls on our economy decrease, the consumer will need to rely more and more on his common law rights, and he will look to the courts to enforce these rights. One of the most important aspects of deregulation will be the deregulation of our laws governing courts and court <coughs> procedures. Now this has already begun. A few years ago, and you heard Leon mention it, the small claims courts were established. These courts have, in a very small way, made justice more accessible to the man in the street. The object in establishing a small claims court is to provide people with a speedy, less expensive means of redress of their rights. In the small claims court, as the name suggests, a person may sue only for small amounts, up to 2,000 rand, and only for civil disputes. The court does not deal with criminal cases. The Small Claims Court Act, which was passed in 1984, has created a deregulated procedural system, an informal forum, without the procedural complexity, especially the leading of evidence. A litigant in the small claims court may not be assisted or represented by a legal uh, practitioner at all, nor by any other person, except in certain cases. And only a natural person may institute action in the small claims court. So a company cannot be the plaintiff, but a company can be the defendant, and often is. In a small claims court, the person handles his case himself 
and his cost is minimal, around 15 rand. The presiding officer of the small claims court is not a judge or a magistrate, he is called a commissioner. And these commissioners are made up of members of the legal profession who perform this work on a voluntary basis as part of the service to the community. And I think the legal profession should get recognition for their contribution to the system. Now the small claim sits only a few days a week after hours in various centers throughout the country. And yet many thousands of cases have already been heard by the small claims court. The majority of cases have been brought by domestic workers. So it is interesting to know that the domestic workers are using the small claims court. The small claims court have proved that people can afford to bring their cases to court, but the system as it is at present is inadequate and as I said only exists a few hours a week. The jurisdiction is limited and Leon has already mentioned no one can get an interdict in a small claims court. In fact, the Small Claims Court Act was amended this year expressly removing the interdict procedure from that court. And I would suggest that this should be amended once again to allow interdict procedure. It's one of those actions which is very useful if your neighbor is partying all night and you can't sleep or does it every night of the week, your best remedy is an interdict. And if you had to go to the magistrate or Supreme Court, it would be very costly. So you'd probably just live with the deafening noise, whereas you could choose to use the small claims court if the procedure was available. The Minister of Justice, Mr. Kirby Kutsir, is very concerned about the problem of accessibility to the courts and is now giving serious consideration to creating alternative procedures within the magistrate's court system which could incorporate the deregulated system now operating in the small claims court. This would be a very significant and important step in bringing the system of justice closer to the people. And it is a step which would be greatly welcomed because it would accommodate many of the shortcomings that exist in the small claims court. Access to the law is costly because the procedural rules in the magistrate and, con and supreme court are very complex. And although any person may represent himself in any court, a person invariably will have to obtain the services of a lawyer to argue his case. The legal profession in South Africa is highly respected for the excellent standards that it maintains both in its work and in its adherence to ethical principles. However, the present structure of the profession with the divided bar, attorneys and advocates, and the numerous restrictions which the profession places on itself and on its members is no doubt a major factor attributable to the ever-increasing costs of litigation. This is not a new issue. It has been debated for many years. It was one of the subjects I had to write an essay on as a student. <coughs> and it is still not yet resolved. I do not believe that we in South Africa can continue the luxury of a divided bar. We are duplicating and multiplicating the costs of litigation by requiring at least two legal practitioners for each Supreme Court case and by excluding attorneys from appearing alone in the Supreme Court. In England, where the bar is divided, and it's not divided in the United States, I might mention, it has already been proposed that suitable qualified attorneys and advocates may qualify to the, appear in the Supreme Court provided they obtain certain certificates. And this would be a desirable route for South Africa to follow. And there's another point. At present, no member of the public may have direct access to an advocate. This also increases the cost of access to the law because the consumer has to go to an attorney first 
should he wish to seek the expert advice of an advocate. There is a further duplication of the charges and this procedure should change. It's also being proposed in England that lawyers who are employed, in other words not practicing at the bar, should have the right to appear in court. In South Africa, we have a shortage of skills. Surely here too, all qualified lawyers should have the right of appearance, provided, of course, there is adherence to ethical principles. And there's another factor, the tariff, which attorneys charge for court cases and for conveyancing fees are fixed at a minimum fee. Now this is a factor which contributes to the cost of access to the law because an attorney may not charge a fee below the statutory minimum. This system should not be continued, permitted to continue. If the fixed minimum tariff became the recommended tariff, as is already the case with engineers and architects, attorneys would be free to charge less, there could be greater competition within the profession, and this would greatly benefit the consumers. There's another factor. Certain work done by attorneys is reserved exclusively to them. For example, a conveyancer. Now, the need for more conveyances will increase as land ownership moves into the hands of millions of blacks who, until recently, have been denied this right. This closed shop of conveyances should be opened, as it has already in England. Of course, one must have suitably qualified people, but why have the closed shop? In the legal profession, there is a prohibition against advertisements. This means that important information is not available to consumers. To help them choose appropriate attorneys for their needs, now, where attorneys offer specialist <coughs> services, this would be a very useful kind of information. And appropriate advertisements should be allowed. I'm not suggesting that we take the American route, which is very amusing, but I think not in very good taste, where an attorney or a lawyer appears on the TV screen, he introduces himself and his firm, and he says, this week my firm has got a special on divorces. <laughs> And I've seen one like that, and I've seen one with a special on insolvency. So you can get divorced this week at a lower price and go insolvent next week at a lower price. But we do need advertisements, and that adver those advertisements should be governed by the self-regulatory measures under the Advertising Standards Authority and not by statute. There's another factor. The South African law permits prohibits a lawyer from charging a percentage of the damages won by his client. This is called a contingency fee. Many arguments have been advanced against allowing contingency fees, but there is a strong argument in favor of them. It could result in reducing the cost of litigation. Now, the consumer protection and legal remedies have to be enforced by the consumer himself. <clears throat> the consumer must institute action as plaintiff. The law frowns upon any person who encourages another person to institute action. This is called a maintenance agreement and is an unenforceable contract. If, if you offer someone a thousand rand to prosecute a case, to follow a case, the law frowns on such maintenance agreement. Now, what I've been talking about is a person's theoretical right to approach the court. But there are countless people in South Africa who are ignorant of their rights, who cannot afford the cost, and numerous others who are too afraid to become involved in litigation. We in South Africa are not litigious people. In other jurisdictions, individuals other than the aggrieved person and even community organizations can bring cases to court on behalf of others. 
Two such procedures are the class actions and public interest actions. To allow such actions, the laws prohibiting the funding of litigation would have to be changed and even perhaps contingency fees permitted. In a class action, one legally interested party can bring an action for all the other members of his class and the court decision would then apply to all members of that class. We have no such action in South Africa and perhaps this is a defect in our system. Such an action could be used for civil rights suits and class actions <coughs> are actually hated and criticized by many abroad. They are often called legalized blackmail and the Frankenstein of the courts. So not everybody favors class actions. Then there is the public interest action, which is based on a desire to benefit a large section of the public. A person who brings such action must have the intention to protect public interest and not necessarily his own. In Canada, public interest actions are allowed. Yet elsewhere, difficulties have been raised against public interest actions and because of the court's reluctance to permit such actions, legislation has intervened in countries like Germany, France and Sweden where laws have given locus standi, the right to appear in court, to consumer bodies on matters affecting consumers. Unfortunately, the status of class actions and public interest actions is unsettled throughout the world and their future is uncertain. Both are designed to make justice accessible to sizable groups or to the public at large. But both are very difficult to fit into the legal framework. Yet I do believe that we have to find ways and means to give effect to judicial protection to groups and public interest bodies which have in the past been unrepresented or underrepresented. <coughs> In conclusion, I would like to say that access to the law is a fundamental human right. Rights which cannot be enforced are meaningless. Let us ensure that when South Africa finally has its Bill of Rights, provision will be made for access to the courts for all who seek the protection of their rights. Thank you. This is not a question, if you just excuse me, there's apparently an urgent request for Mrs. Anna Boschel from the Dairy Board to phone her secretary. I've got the telephone number, I would have thought she knows that, 286-4-0-0. I think the price of eggs is about to go up. <laughs> Yes, um, you are noted. If you move to into the eye, or the um, I want to address this uh, question to Professor Tager. Um, I want to ask if somebody wants to go to the small small claims court, where do we find the small claims court and what is the procedure and what is the waiting period? Magistrate's Court, and there is a clerk 
he will then take the information and set down the matter on the roll. The law clinics at the Rand Afrikaans University and the Witz Law Clinic also render assistance to people who wish to bring actions in the small claims court, drawing up a simple summons. Um, the waiting period is, I think, under three weeks. The, the cases are processed fairly quickly. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My name is Carmen Nathan. I'm a former Dean of the Law School of the University of Bapuritswana. I'm also the um, author of the Consumer Affairs Act of Bapuritswana. Most of the um, suggestions made by Mr. Lowe and Professor Tager today have been incorporated in our Act, which was passed in 1984. And as suggested by Professor Tager and Mr. Lowe, education is so important. We have a very big education uh, program going. Perhaps a little later, Mr. Massimong, who's in charge of it, might get an opportunity to say a few words. But our organization, unlike those that are represented here today, is one that does not rely on the private sector at all. We are funded nationally, and that is through the State Revenue Fund, but our statute protects our autonomy, so we can act more freely than most. For example, if we ran a seminar, we would never allow a poster like that on our wall. It's very difficult to take sponsorship from people in the private sector and then go to Mr. Ackerman and say, Mr. Ackerman, how come all your chickens, no matter what the brand name, are generally of the same price? Because to me, that is not good for the consumer, as Mr. Lowe pointed out earlier in his talk. There have been suggestions made for resolutions, and perhaps I could have a bit of input into that with the suggestion. And perhaps Professor Tag or Mr. Lowe would like to react to what I say. In South Africa, you have the Dairy Board, the Meat Board, and many other types of boards. And although they might be good for the meat industry, they're certainly not good for the consumer, as we've learned this morning from Mr. Lowe. Surely, the various organizations here today, if they're going to do something practical for the consumer, these people should be at the top of their list. It's no good a person going to the claims court for anybody but the person who goes to the claims court. A big organization and a powerful one. Do you think it's worried if somebody wins a 10, 20, 100 thousand rand claim in the small claims court? These things aren't even advertised. It might get around a bit by word of mouth, but these decisions are not reported. These things don't uh, get much publicity other than the very limited amount that is done by your organizations. So somehow or other there needs to be a concerted effort by the consumer against those people who really stand in the way of a free market. The other suggestion that I would like to make, and perhaps somebody could comment on, the South African Law Commission at the moment has a subcommittee that's looking at unfair contract terms. They did come and have a seminar with us in uh, Mabatu looking at the different things that we have introduced and following them through in our marketplace to see how they work. I think that the organizations here today ought to, that is the free market type organizations, not the milk board and the dairy board and so on. I think that those organizations, if they have not already had an input in that committee and in its report, should make some sort of an effort in that direction. Thank you, Madam Chair.
recently uh, Isabel Jones um, in her price tags uh, program brought to the attention the fact that because of course this bus company isn't subsidized the company of course has to make profits and it issues a ticket I think it's weekly and if that ticket is not taken up then hard luck for the person who uses that ticket for instance for the sake of illness is an example now what I would like to point out is that privatization isn't necessarily going to be a benefit to the consumer I have um, experienced this in Birmingham in England where I was brought up born and brought up um, I used to have the privilege when I worked there of a bus company that was subsidised by the municipality. Now it is privatised and as a result, of course the company has to make a profit, as a result the buses are fewer, they don't keep to their timetables and they also make much longer routes sort of going around the Brecon as it were. So that as I say, privatisation isn't necessarily going to be a benefit to the consumer. The other point about privatisation in England at any rate, I don't think it would apply here, is that with the larger uh, companies that uh, were previously nationalised, that now uh, the ordinary man in the street has become a shareholder. This has broken the back of the trade unions to some extent, I think. Um, it's, as I say, this is merely a comment. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask Terry Markman to comment because he's probably perhaps one of the world's experts on transport deregulation and privatization, certainly to my knowledge South Africa's expert. But I'm going to use the opportunity since the question is directed to me to say a few things first. <clears throat> and the first point is that privatization is not necessarily good. And we must make that very, very clear. It is not good to create a private monopoly. And I don't know whether the buses you speak of in Britain were a privatized monopoly. De it, I expect so. Uh, Professor Shenoy says she apparently has knowledge of it. That would be my prediction. If with privatization the price rises and the quality declines or the service declines, I think that one's pretty safe at predicting that what you've done is created a private government protected monopoly. Now deregulation and privatization are two different things in the sense that you can deregulate without privatizing or privatize without deregulating. What I would recommend there can be no argument against is deregulating. In other words, even if the state continues to supply buses or the municipality, allow free competition. Combi taxis, additional buses, rickshaws, cycle cabs, whatever it might be. Uh, just a huge variety of transport services to the consumer. The next point is that if you subsidize the supplier, and incidentally Patco is subsidized, then as I said, it is in the self-interest of the supplier to maximize the cost. That is what you would do if you were supplying a subsidized service. You would think of all sorts of ways of you know, having bigger cars, bigger fringe benefits, overseas trips to conferences, whatever it might be, uh, because in the end the subsidy will be a percentage of your operating cost. The government will not allow you to make more than, for example, 10% profit. They're not going to subsidize someone who makes more than some imaginary level of profit, say 10%. Whatever. So that what you have to do is 10% of a bigger sum is more money than 10% of a lesser sum. So you have to make the sum bigger. You have to make the amount on which the subsidy is calculated more in order to get more profit and more money. And uh, the simple answer for Patco and anyone else is to firstly allow free competition in transport services. Secondly, subsidize the consumer, not the supplier. Now, the way the transport subsidy works is an attempt to subsidize the consumer, but I have my doubts that it works. What I would suggest is very, very simple, is give all consumers 
who use public transport the subsidy directly in the form of transport vouchers. You have a set of transport vouchers which you can use with any form of transport you like. Combi taxis, rickshaws, cycles, private cars, traveling in and out of work, whatever it might be. And the recipient of those vouchers collects the voucher plus whatever extra charge they want to charge and then deposits that in their bank and gets money from the transport department. But what I can say is what's very intra-instructive is why do subsidies never go to the consumers? And consumers need to think about that very carefully. Why, whenever there's a subsidy, is some excuse found to pay the subsidy to the supplier, not to the consumer? And you need to realize the reason is that it's not intended actually to help the consumer. And if it were true that the subsidy helped the consumer, you would not expect suppliers to lobby for it. You would not expect Patco buses to lobby for transport subsidies, or bakers to lobby for bread subsidies. The fact that they spend lots of money motivating the subsidy should give you a clue as to who gets the benefit. It should give you a clue that it helps them. Whereas if the subsidy went to the consumer, in welfare vouchers, which they can use on whatever, and they competed freely in the marketplace for those vouchers, the suppliers, then you would have a pretty good guarantee that the consumer benefits are not the supplier. I don't want to single out Patco, but I think that a good example we have right now is with partial deregulation of transport. What do we see? We see a hundred thousand combi taxis not only collecting no subsidies, but in most cases, or many cases, paying tax. So, we tax the people who provide the transport that clearly the masses want and prefer, and subsidize those that apparently the commuters want less. In Velcom, incidentally, they privatized the buses, and the bus company went broke. People say that this was a privatization of failure. We think it's a great success. The sooner bad services go broke, the better. Within two days, Velcom was serviced by combi taxis. So the two consumer complaints came out of Velcom. Uh, and now Bel Velcom has saving two and a half million rand a year in subsidies. By all accounts, a better and more frequent and more versatile service. And anybody is apparently free to go and provide a better bus service. Remember, the subsidy costs the consumer. The consumer pays, and usually pays twice. On average, every single subsidy rand costs two rand. So the consumer pays two rand for every one rand of benefit. And then I doubt that it's a benefit. In the end, the service actually costs more. So very, very important competition. Very, very important, not just privatization. Privatization without deregulation is not what uh, one would recommend. Uh, Mr. Markman, do you want to say something? Uh, done his job quite well. Yes. Uh, my name is Lily B. Morgan. I'm from the Consumer Union. While we have Professor Tager here this morning, I think it's, it's uh, our opportunity to ask her after the operation of the Business Practices Committee for the last year, um, certain sort of uh, guidelines must have developed over the year. And we have uh, also from our side and from other consumers' side have realized that there's certain things that we as consumers cannot do, cannot get right, unless certain procedures and guidelines are being made available to us and the trade or whoever to help us to become better consumers and not to be uh, looked off, if that is the word. Now, are you? what are you looking at for a particular guidelines? Are you looking at it, something like the Lemon Act in uh, the States, where you purchase second-hand cars? Are you looking at certain guidelines for the consumer for returns at shops that we know when prices may be changed? Like, for instance, that the continuous sales that they have, which are illegal in England, have you got certain guidelines that you're going to put forward to us for credit cards which they apparently have in, uh, in certain countries that here apparently if you don't sign your card you still um, 
libel for what they are. There might be many other examples which I can't think of. But, uh, Professor, what in fact are you doing and what have you uh, identified that needs to be done from the work you're doing there? Um, as you probably know, the Business Practices Committee is not a full-time committee. I'm not a full-time chairman. So there is a shortage of resources, human resources. Uh, during the past year, there have been more than 120 cases that we've processed. My attitude in dealing with the cases generally is that uh, the cases must be dealt with perhaps through the courts, if often just individual complaints. As you know, we uh, looked into a scheme of, uh, like the Kubus Quirkere scheme, a similar scheme was run by the same person selling stamps. It wasn't the sale of stamps that worried us, but the misleading, deceitful way in which the public were conned into making large investments into the <coughs> scheme. We've also looked at the whole question of life rights. You probably know that South Africa, or certainly white South Africa, is an aging population, and retirement villages have become big property business. Uh, most, or many, sales are sales of life rights. And we looked into the nature of the life rights because we are concerned that people believe that after paying 100, 120,000 rand, they are secure for life. And the sale of a life right is unsecured and gives no property rights to an individual. So that is something we've identified and we will be making that information uh, known through the press and just alerting people to the nature of life rights. Another aspect of the Business Practices Committee has been to look more at the self-regulatory bodies. Recently, I'm sure I won't mention the actual scheme, but the whole of South Africa got in, taken in by a big giveaway. Congratulations, you've won a prize, and here are the six prizes, which one do you want? And it would surprise you how many people invested 40 rand to see which prize he would win. Now, my attitude on that particular scheme was, if the people involved <coughs> complied with the Advertising Standards Authority Code of Practice, made the full disclosure, then I would be satisfied without interfering, because it's not the role of the Business Practices Committee to interfere in the free market system, but simply to ensure that adequate disclosures are made and so on. So what I have done, and that's not the only instance, but I've looked to the Direct Marketing Association, free, uh, the Advertising Standards Authority, with their own code, and asked them to be applied. <coughs> and the parties invariably agree. And there's no ne necessity for high-level action to be taken through the gazettes and closure of businesses. So, in answer to what we've been doing, those are the sum of the things. As far as guidelines and all the areas you have mentioned, we're not yet in a position to deal with those kind of areas. We are looking into trade coupons <coughs> and trading steps, and the notice will or has already been published in the Gazette, calling upon interested persons to comment, because at the moment the legislation controls trading stamps and trade coupons. We're looking to see what we are going to do about this in the future. Of course, there's a host of matters to be dealt with, and who knows? I'm hoping that I don't want to be overambitious. There's much to be attended to. Uh, okay, can I, with your permission, make a comment? The firm will not need to locate on our Buitenlandse bezoekers, so it's not the English player to do so. The, uh, I just want to make the observation, the Lemon Law in America, which you refer to, I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but it's a delightful term. Uh, I, I often feel like I need a Lemon Law. It's where you buy one of those products that just keeps going wrong, and you take it in again, and a car or whatever, and a washing machine, and after the tenth time you've had it in for repair, where you form a sort of partnership with a the supplier. They have it during the week, and you get it back over the weekend. Um, <laughs> In America, they say what you've done is you've bought a lemon and they just have to replace it at a certain point. Uh, the, the, in, the, this is a good example of the kind of law that, in my view, is not necessary. 
it is already under the common law one's right to have such a thing replaced if it doesn't serve its purpose reasonably. And the difficulty with just having, say, a lemon law, passing an act, is the consumer is no better off. You, you just now think you have protection, but in practice in America, very, very few people ever get protected by the lemon law. And the other one is the, con the prohibition on con continuous sales. Again, I don't know what the experience is in Britain, but in my view, a continuous sale is probably fraud. And I would like to get together with your body and lay a charge against somebody, prosecute somebody for fraud. And these are very good examples of things that frustrate and anger us all. And so often our, our, our blood gets up and we say we should pass an act against these people. But passing an act doesn't get the thing prosecuted. We'll, it's already illegal, virtually all of these things. And, and it's, it's very important to realize so often we just legislate and legislate and legislate and the tenth time we've outlawed the same thing. It's still not actually being prosecuted. The real thing is to get down to the business of prosecuting these people. To make sure that the law is so quickly and easily and cheaply accessible that we can prosecute a continuous sale, get a lemon replaced, etc., etc. It's already our right as consumers under the existing common law new act will merely make us think we've got something extra which we haven't. Thank you. We'll allow one, just one question. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if I'll take uh, Professor Taylor out of her room. I understood about the small claims and the procedure and all. Now, I'd like to understand if Perhaps now it's more than a two thousand because the small thing you said it's something like a two thousand. The procedure is it necessary that you go to the attorney first? Because now you have said something again that uh, like duplicating the cost. Now what is the procedure if it is more than the amount which you have just said without getting to the attorney first, avoiding duplicating the cost? Then another thing I came is, I don't know now which this one to whom am I directing. Uh, there are rules and acts. I don't know whether they are only pertaining to a certain group of uh, people. For an example, when you perhaps buy a furniture in the shop as a consumer, you like it, and then it's delivered in the home. When you go to arrange that, now it doesn't suit you. And now, it is so difficult, they don't want to take it back. And now it means now you are forced to use a thing which doesn't suit you anymore. Is there a rule which can protect a consumer to that effect? And then what is a procedure for that? Thank you. Um, in a small claim, sometimes courts will not permitted to have an attorney, so the duplication of costs does not exist. So the answer is that the person who wants to sue in a small claims court goes by himself, not with an attorney. So there's no, the costs are very low, as I said, about 15 rand. Now, if the, where the jurisdiction is only 2,000, a person can only claim 2,000. The commission of a small claims court can't award damages for more than 2,000. What a person could do, and it would be very practical to do, assuming your claim is for 3,000. Now, if you brought that claim to the magistrate's court, it would cost you about 1,000 rand to bring the case to the magistrate's court. You could apply through the small claims court and then abandon the 1,000. In other words, you can reduce the ca your claim to tailor make it to the jurisdiction of the small claims court. But the court has no power to award more than 2,000 rand. It's the individual's choice. If he wants to forego part of the claim in order to get a cheaper procedure. Now, in the future, if the scheme goes forward, where the magistrate's court will also have procedures, deregulated <laughs> procedures like small claims court, then the jurisdiction of the magistrate's court is much higher 
and the amount that can be claimed, I can't read, I think it's 10,000. Uh, it keeps changing, but it's around 10,000. So that if people could get the benefit of deregulated court procedures in the magistrate's court, they wouldn't have to uh, have the huge expense of attorney's fees. Now, the other question that you asked, perhaps I should ask Leon to ask. <coughs> yes, I think there's, it depends here on a number of things. One is that the law says, the common law says that if you buy something that doesn't serve the purpose for which it's intended, then uh, you, can re you can return it and get your money back. So that a supplier is obliged to tell you if you're buying something that doesn't serve the purpose for which it's intended, so that you buy it consciously taking the risk, or unless you're told you're allowed to return it. If, however, you buy something that serves the purpose for which it's intended, but you change your mind as to whether you like it later on, like you buy a dress that you decide that your husband doesn't like, or a, a, a lounge suite that you decide later on doesn't match your curtains or whatever, then I'm afraid that's just a, a, a mistake one has made. And we all make those mistakes continually, and I make them far too often. Um, so what you can then do, I'm afraid, is go to the supplier and try and do a deal and say, look, I made a mistake, will you take this back and, and knock off some of the price or whatever? You just have to go and do the best you can. And maybe ask the dealer if you can resell to someone else. But there's got to be a, there's got to be a distinction between where you've made a con, a, a, an unintended error of judgment. You wanted uh, uh, a blue one. You bought a blue one, and later on you decide you should have bought a red. You should have bought a red one. But that's not the supplier's fault, and you just have to go and ask the supplier to accommodate you. But if, for example, you buy a, a pen, a pencil, and it turns out that the pencil there are no leads that fit the pencil in the marketplace. Then, this, then you can have it replaced because it cannot serve the purpose for which it was intended. So it depends on really whose fault it is, yours or the supplier's. Does that answer your question? I think just a very important slogan I like is that one must always remember that the thing a consumer wants most is the right to be wrong. In other words, your freedom as a consumer includes the freedom to make mistakes. And, and those mistakes, I'm afraid, you sometimes just have to live with. I do want to say that this, we, it, we didn't comment, I didn't respond to uh, Carmen Nathan's comment about the Botswana ombudsman thing, uh, because it was, it was a good comment. I just do want to say that it is very impressive what literature they've supplied. It's available all over Botswana, and very simple pamphlets available to consumers that warn them about this sort of thing. Think carefully before you buy. Uh, you might change your mind later. Take your time. Shop around. Good advice. Good guidance. I have the full set of, doc of pamphlets issued by the, the Pulitzwana Ombudsman, which is, is really good stuff. I can just recommend it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to break for tea. I would like to advise those of us who have not yet registered, please use the tea break for registering. And if we could all reassemble at 10.45 in the hall. Thank you. <coughs>
easier way to remember what's just gone before. Please make your questions rather than statements as short as possible. We haven't got a lot of time. Our first speaker is Mr. Esau Ndumzulu. His career has been devoted to personal training and development. He's worked as a personal assistant at Bar Reef Mines and as a training officer at Robertson's. From there, he joined the staff of Free Market Trading as a <coughs> trainer in economic education. He's now a manager of the Free Market Training Centre in Johannesburg. And this morning, he will be speaking on the topic consumer sovereignty in a deregulated society. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start, I would like to share something with you. On my way coming over here, I overheard some people speak. And one guy was saying, it is unfair that the consumer should be paying so much money. The other guy asked, what should we do? And the other guy said, I think the best way is the poor consumer doesn't know what he wants. He doesn't know what he wants to eat. He doesn't know what he wants to wear. The best way to help him is we have to tie his feet. We have to tie his arms. We have to blindfold him. And we have to organize everything that he needs for him. Now, my question to you, ladies and gentlemen, today in my presentation, I am going to share with you the consequences of consumer, consumers' economic power. I will share also, I'll explain to you the meaning of, of the following economic terms, consumer sovereignty, and uh, I will explain a deregulated society. I will also explain with an aid of a simplified structure of a free market economy how a free market, op a free market economy operates. And uh, I'll give you some implication of consumer economic power. And in closing, I will give you two wonderful quotations from one of the greatest economists, uh, Ludwig von Mises. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, who wields the economic power in a deregulated society? Who determines the prices, that is, the prices of the factors of production, that is, land, labor, money, and know-how? Who determines the pattern of production? Who determines entrepreneurial profits and losses? and who determine money saved and invested. Consumer sovereignty means the economic power consumers exercise on the market by buying or refusing to buy. Deregulated society means a society free from government imposed and enforced restrictions, directives, or orders. It is a society in which, through the process of selling and buying, by producing and consuming, individuals contribute to the total working of society. A society where one is not allowed to use force or fraud where one can act in one's own self-interest, that is, get someone's money or service or good, if one gives 
one something or does something which one likes more than what one gives up. <coughs> a society in which everyone serves his fellow citizens and is served by them in turn. That is a free society. A society in which a free market economy operates. Before discussing in depth consumer sovereignty in a deregulated society, let us look at how a free market economy operates. I'll be using a simplified structure here on the uh, uh, overhead. Speaker. Uh, from this simplified structure, we are here, and in these areas I have consumers who are the owners of the factors of production, that is know-how, land, labor, and money. These, in a free market economy, flows from this end over to the entrepreneurs. At a price, in other words, they move freely, but at a price which uh, the two people can negotiate. And then on this end, we have entrepreneurs who will use those factors of production also to send them or to sell them freely over to these people, meaning to the consumers. In other words, there is a free movement of factors of production from this end over to that end. And there is a free movement of a variety of goods and services from this end over to this end. Now, when this move over there, it's free, money flows also freely from this end over to the side. When goods and services for flows freely over the side, money also flows freely from this end over to that side for the variety of goods and services. Apart from that, consumers freely saved, save their money, meaning their money moves from this end freely over to that end without any problem. The point is, if more consumers are actually selling the effects of production from this side to the other side, it means more money is going to be flowing from this end to that end. And if more factors of production flow that side, it means more money is going to be flowing from that end to the same. <coughs> and when the consumers have their income, part of that income is spent to buy a variety of goods and services which are freely available. Part of their money or part of their income is also used, is used to spend also freely in other words, in a free market, there is a free flow of goods and services from this end over to that end, a free flow of money from that end to this end, a free flow of saving from this end to that end, a free flow of money from this end over to that side, a free flow of uh, 
a variety of goods and services from that end to that end. I'll just complete this here and then continue with the talk up here. Remember, the free flow of money and goods only takes place under a free market economy. That is, under such conditions, consumers and entrepreneurs will try to better their own situation. But entrepreneurs will have to supply households or consumers with goods and services. And they will in turn receive their money votes in turn. Now what happens in a free market economy? Buying is like voting. If consumers buy from a specific entrepreneur, the, entrepre the entrepreneur will receive more money votes. And if consumers do not buy, the entrepreneur will lose the money vote. Which means by buying and refusing to buy, in that instance, consumers are actually determining the are determining the um, are determining people who are making profit and they are determining people who are making losses by buying or refusing to buy that is in the free market what happens again is if consumers buy a particular article and more of them buy a particular article more money votes will flow for that particular article and it means the entrepreneurs who are making that article will make more of that article. In, if a particular article is not made or is made and is not satisfying consumers and consumers spend less money on that particular product, it means less of that product is going to be made. It means buy also, buying and not buying consumers are actually determining the production pattern of that society. In other words, the more they buy, the more that product will be made. The less they buy, the less that product will be made. <laughs> the other thing again, we said there is a free flow of money. In other words, if more money flows from the consumers to the entrepreneurs, it means there will be more money spent on particular products. Now, the other problem, maybe, that consumers have in South Africa is that there is a problem with a free flow of money and goods, and that prevents a variety of goods and services flowing from one end to the next end. Now, the other thing is, consumers, by investing, more of their money by saving more of part of their income or not saving, they're actually then determining they, the money saved and invested. In other words, the consumer in a free market decides the money that is going to be available for saving and he actually decides the money that is going to be available for investment. In other words, again, the consumer, when he buys a particular product, it means he likes to pay the price. And if he refuses to pay that particular price, it means he rejects the price. So alternatively, it means the entrepreneur will have to adjust the price to the level that the consumers are willing to pay. By that token again, it means consumers are deciding the actual prices of articles in a free market economy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in the free market, in a free market economy, individuals are free to act within the orbit of private property and the market. His choices are final. Society does not tell a man what to do and what not to do. There is no need to force cooperation by special orders or prohibitions. Non-cooperation penalizes 
itself. Which means the market does not prevent anybody from arbitrarily inflicting harm on his fellow citizen. It only puts a penalty upon such conduct. Which means a shopkeeper or an entrepreneur is free to be rude to his consumers provided he is ready to pay the cost. The information provided thus far shows that in a free market, consumers wield economic power. They instruct entrepreneurs to abandon an eminent position in the economic system or to adjust their actions to their wishes and orders to show again that the consumer is the boss in actual fact in a free market they are the ultimate made bosses <coughs> because they have a right to be foolish which means they have a right to make mistakes no one can prevent them from making them but of course they will have to pay the price for the mistakes. It was mentioned earlier on there that one needs to get information. I want to share this again with you. I had some problems with my car. I just want to show how important information is in a, for the consumer. I phoned some few spare parts and the prices I got from them was 190 for the same thing. Then I told myself, look, let me shop around and see what happens. What I did, I finally landed at somebody who was prepared to pay me to let me buy that article for 130 instead of 192. If I was foolish enough to spend 192, I could have lost money. So what I did, I shopped around and finally I got something that for the same product I paid 130, which show how important again consumer um, how important consumers should possibly look for information. Now, ladies and gentlemen, consumers determine prices in a free market economy by buying or not buying. Consumers, by buying or not buying, determine the production pattern. Consumers, by buying or not buying in a free market, determine entrepreneurial profits and loss and they also determine money saved and invested remember consumers in a free market make entrepreneurs who serve their interest better rich and those who don't poor they are merciless bosses full of whims and fences they are changeable and unpredictable for them, nothing counts other than their own satisfaction. They do not care. They do not care for the past merit of vested interest. In concluding, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give you this from Ludwig von Mises. Liberty and freedom are the conditions of men within a contractual society social cooperation under a system of private ownership of the means of production means that within the range of the market the individual is not bound to serve an overlord as far as he gives and serve other people he does so on his own accord to, re to be rewarded and served by the receivers the second one is what impels every man to the utmost exertion in the service of his fellow man? And innate tendencies, fellow man, and caps innate tendencies towards arbitrariness and malice is the market, not compulsion and coercion on the part of the gendarmes, hangmen, and penal courts. It is self-interest. The member of the contractual society 
is free because he serves others in serving himself. Now, in closing, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say, if we want to restore the power of the consumer, we have to battle to try and establish a free society in South Africa, where the free flow of money from one direction to the other direction, the free flow of goods from one direction to the other direction is going to make competition um, easier and you have uh, heard what competition does in actual fact whether you want to get into a bus or a taxi or on a bicycle or on a race car then the decision is going to be rest is going to solely rest with you it's not going to rest with anybody making a decision whether you're going to get onto a bus or you're going to buy a particular product i believe if we want to put the consumer we want to help the consumer as much as possible we have to try and establish a free society because it is only in a free society where choices are unlimited. You can sink and swim because you want to sink and you will swim because you want to swim. Thank you very much. Now, 10 minutes question time, which I will take from the floor, because I think it's perhaps a little awkward to write them um, and send them in. <coughs> Would you please identify yourself? Ian Kininza from um, Nagwane. The speaker spoke so much um, of a free society, free enterprise, and um, this apparently seems to pose um, a threat to the already practicing um, entrepreneur or businessman. How can we allay the fears of the existing businessman who had the monopoly hitherto? serving his own interest. He's going to be serving the interest of others. Now, competition in a way is going to allow that we are going to have a lot of entrepreneurs or we are going to have a lot of consumers who are willing to spend their time, their, their money, in actual fact, to get some form of satisfaction. The practicing entrepreneurs do not have to fear a free market economy because in a free market economy people who are efficient they are going to make it people who are actually supplying consumers with the products that they want at the price they are willing to pay is going to be successful and those who are not going to be supplying the consumers with the products at the price that he's willing to pay are actually going to exclude. In actual fact, what the free market does is it creates efficiency. And what efficiency does again generally, it means everybody benefits. Meaning if you are better than your competitor, you are going to get more money. And if you are not better than your competitor, you are going to, f to fall away on the wayside. My name is Paul Masimu from the Consumer Council of Putatswana. I'm the head of the information section there. You, you emphasize the need for a free economy. And I personally feel that the consumer won't effectively take part in the free economy if he is not informed. 
I realized that much of the career up to now was spent in personnel training. Now my question is, what role do you think employers can take in educating consumers and making sure that they become informed and as a result take part effectively in the free economy? Uh, in answering you, I think information is very, very important. In actual fact, I spoke about a free flow of goods and services. What happens in a situation where we have restrictions? Uh, restrictions will make sure in terms of communication that you'll have a communication barrier. There won't be a free flow of things from one end to the other end. I think what is important is in a free economy, or in a free market economy, producers must make sure that consumers are aware that they are selling the best possible product. And one way of doing it is to try and make information available better because if the information you provide as an entrepreneur can convince the consumer that he's getting his money's worth and you are actually looking after his interest by making sure that there's some additional information that you make available to, to that particular person, then I think in that way, uh, entrepreneurs can ensure by making as much information available for their own products. Because if they do so, by then they will be getting the support of the consumers because, because the consumers are trying to get the best at all times. Like I said earlier on, I shopped around for, for, for that thing, but I didn't have information about that. What I did, I only used uh, my, my sort of common sense. I, I, I phoned around and I got the information. But if, if information was made available, if it was freely made available by the suppliers of that particular product, I would have possibly known what to do. Now, I think entrepreneurs, in a way, can help by educating the uh, people who are working in their companies. Some people believe that people who are working in their companies are not consumers. I believe they are the first consumers. If you make those people know the, the let's say, the dangers of using a particular product, I mean, like, t let's take an, an electrical appliance. By making sure that you provide some additional information of the danger of a particular thing, then you will be either protecting the person who's working in your company who will possibly be buying that particular product. Also by providing additional information, you are helping that guy who's working for you to go and give other people information that if you buy that particular product, you must be careful that you are not going to bring that product in contact with water because if that happens, this is what is going to happen. So they have to try and educate their people. And how do you educate people by making information available? I believe. I'm Sally Motlana of the Black Housewives League. Uh, I'm really very interested in the topic because although we speak of communication, we speak of education, we speak of the power of the consumer. What I think we should be considering is that the majority of the consumers in this country are illiterate and therefore uh, communication becomes difficult because they cannot read the contract that is written and they do not know where to complain when they have complaints. My question is, if the producer refuses to adhere to the demands of the consumers, thus resulting in boycotts of the product or the shop or in entrepreneurs, as you say, is he going to benefit anything by those boycotts? Because I have discovered that when we talk to some of these shopkeepers, producers, as consumers, they, in most cases, do not listen to us. Therefore, I maintain, perhaps boycotts are really good. I would like to know from you what your opinion is. Secondly, why is it that whenever there is a boycott of a shop 
or products that are being sold by a shop, in most cases rotten, the service is bad, and there is a boycott of that shop or that product. The government always intervenes. Is it because they get more tax from that producer, or is it because there are other reasons to it? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in answering the first one, I think the, uh, what makes those people to refuse to serve the consumer or to listen to the consumer is the fact that they possibly have a monopoly in that particular industry. Now, if we have a variety of choices, if we have, which we can get under a free market economy, if you have a variety of choices, you can forget about that guy and go to buy to the, the other guy. And what normally, what is going to force him to, 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 to do what the consumer demands is, once he realizes that people are not patronizing him, is going to be forced to change or adjust. Now, he is not going to, to adjust unless, I mean, if there is a variety, people are actually forced to comply in a way that if you stay away from them and other people also stay away from them, that is going to force him, in actual fact, the losses that he will be incurring will be forcing him actually to say, let me see what I can do for the consumer because I have to get them back again. But now the problem we have at the moment we don't have a free society. This is why a person can say, look, whether you jump into the lake or the sea, look, my product is still going to go. This is why we say in helping the consumer, we have to try and battle to achieve or in a way to, to, to help establishing a free society in South Africa. In other words, the variety of people or maybe a lot of people will enter the competition will make the choice of people um, so various that uh, you wouldn't even have to consider. If he's not giving you what you want, you forget about him, you go to the next guy. Now he knows that you can't forget about him because he happens to be the only person who runs the whole uh, system. The other problem again with uh, uh, when people boycott and the government gets in, I don't know the reason why they do so. Uh, probably it might be because um, of something called law and order and something called chaos or chaos, I don't know. Um, but I, I think, like we say, in a free economy, everybody has a right, even actually a right to be foolish. In other words, uh, I believe in the free society, there is no government that will intervene on behalf of anybody. In other words, whether the guy is, if a guy is not doing his job, consumers are going to sort him out. And no government who's going to come in and say, look, help this poor guy because he's not, he's not a good businessman. Good businessmen, bad businessmen are going to be actually kicked out. And good businessmen are going to, 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 to be in the market. Now, that is going to actually force other people to try and satisfy consumers much better. Because, I mean, a deregulated society is where individuals decide what they want to do with their buying power. Whether they want to buy or they don't want to buy, um, the whole thing is in their hands and there won't be any intervention by government to help anybody who's not satisfying what the consumers want. Thank you. My name is Debbie Collins and I work as a director of the Fair Lady magazine Consumer Test Task started in April this year because we felt that it's very difficult for consumers to buy appliances or food products. Um, most, a, a lot of stores don't offer um, help, assistance, so consumers go around from appliance to appliance. Not really sure um, which one will best suit their needs. And what we do is we get all these appliances and food products into what we call our test house and we evaluate them properly. We mentioned brands, and I believe we're the first magazine in the country to do this. And we've got to be incredibly careful because you know how much money manufacturers put into all their products. Excuse me, could you bring, give your question, please? Because okay. we're running out of time. All right. What I, what I really want to say is I feel the media is very important, okay, um, to help educate people, okay, to help educate a free economy. I feel that consumer bodies should join together 
I want to know if they are going to join together to form a strong, powerful consumer lobby, which will help the media educate consumers. And I'd just like to hear your, co your comments, Madam Chair. Um, I believe, and I think all consumer bodies do believe, that everybody should work together because it is unity is strength. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen, but it's a good point you brought up, and I believe that we should make a greater effort for the consumer bodies to work together. Okay. Um, now, we are running out of time. It's actually one minute to go before the ten minutes, but I'll take two more questions, but please, questions, not statements, and please keep them short, Mr. Levin. Perhaps Mr. Ngomazulu is a bit modest because he didn't reply to Paul Massimoni's question by explaining the course he himself presents with Justice for All, which is a quite an extraordinary program offered by hundreds of employers in South Africa to literally hundreds of thousands of workers that actually addresses that very issue, how to educate the workers to be able to exercise their consumer rights and power in, in the free market. Perhaps he would... Please just tell us quickly about that fact. It's, it's unduly modest. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Law. <laughs> yeah, in, in actual fact, I wanted to, to do it, uh, but I thought I would be uh, taken to task for direct selling here. On the <laughs> in actual fact, the Free Market uh, Foundation, uh, uh, the, the, the training division, has a, a program called uh, With Justice for All which is a, a video uh, program which actually explains basic economics. In other words, it explains you don't need to have gone to school to understand anything that is presented in the program. In other words, people who can write or who can't even read, they only need to present themselves and they, the bulk of the information, the sharing of ideas together with the trainers or instructors actually give those people a hell of a lot of information. In actual fact, the response is so promised, it's, it's so encouraging that we have quite a number of people who have gone through the program who didn't have any formal education. Today they are running their own little puzzles. Some people are running their some uh, spuzzle shops, some are running their own little, I don't know what we can call them. In actual fact, it educates them because they realize that they don't have to depend on anybody. They can do it themselves. And that is important again. I mean, uh, if we base on what the, we have been talking about the whole day, is that uh, uh, we have to rely on ourselves. I mean, if I, as a consumer, feel there are things that I want done, I have to stand up and do things. And that, that program is very, very, very good. So people who are actually interested, if I have to say, I might provide um, additional information maybe during or after the conference. <coughs> Thank you. One more question. There seems to be a lady by the microphone. Thank you, Madam Chief. My question, my name is Anastasia Tula from Bopilo Community Association and affiliate of uh, Black Consumer Union. My question or my advice to Mr. Ngemezulu, should we continue participating in the so-called uh, talks about price increase, which are normally, uh, it's a procedure that normally happens when there's a price increase of maize, in particular, which is our staple food, and we representing the black consumer, we normally go there to participate in particular to see to it whether we will achieve negotiation, negotiating the subsidy and also the uh, maybe the price not to go up. But to our experience, we always come out being frustrated and uh, feeling, well, it is useless. And as you have said rightly, that uh, in the absence of a uh, uh, no free society, it looks like maybe it's not worth it. So I wonder, what is your advice? Thank you, Mrs. Tula. What I would say to you is, 
if I believe consumers are competent enough with, if they can be given additional information, they can actually negotiate their own prices with their own suppliers. The problem that we have here is that somebody stops somebody from producing something and then say, look, I'm going to be the middleman. And in being the middleman, I'm going to make sure you, that you get the best deal. That process, in actual fact, is dangerous because prices will never get down, will actually move up because um, there will be a hell of manipulation of prices there. Now, if we allow the market forces to take over, the market forces, by buying and selling, or by buying and refusing, in actual fact, what is going to happen is, it's going to adjust the prices accordingly. Now, the problem that we have with these uh, bodies where they say, let's come and discuss about the prices, they, you go in and discuss prices, they have actually made up their minds, and uh, whatever conclusion they have to reach, they have to make a profit by hook or crook, Whereas in a free market economy, the market forces are actually going to say, if you don't supply the supplier, the, the, the consumer with what he wants, at the price that he can afford, forget it, he's not going to patronize you. Now, as long as we don't have a free market, discussing with some people on how you can adjust the price this way or that way is not going to benefit the consumer. The best way to benefit the consumer is to allow the market forces take over the market and determine the prices and in that way people who are not doing their best meaning if farmers are sitting down and loafing they're not going to make money forget it and those farmers who are going out there and making sure that they're going to supply whatever they have cheaply and possibly at any convenient place for the consumer are going to make it in other words let us make sure that the prices are going to be determined by the market forces of supply and demand. Anybody at the moment saying he knows he's a fundi in terms of making consumers feel better about the prices adjusted, it's not solving the problem. The problem can only be solved by allowing the market forces to take over. And that is, we allow the free market system to take over. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Mark Swanepoel, he's a founder member of the Free Market Foundation and director of the Free Market Training. He's author and designer of the with Justice for All Sources. Sorry, be that okay. Of, of all course. An economic education program which has so far been used by 400 companies throughout South Africa train over half a million people in the basic principles of economics. In 87, he received the Free Market Award for an outstanding contribution to the cause of economic freedom in South Africa. He will speak on the topic, rising prices, not greedy businessmen, or what? Thank you, Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I'm talking about rising prices today, if in fact it's caused by greedy businessmen. Now, uh, something that cost uh, approximately 20 cents in 1970 will cost uh, roughly two rand today. In other words, roughly a tenfold increase in price. Uh, somebody who earned a thousand rand in 1970, you will have to earn 10,000 Rand today just to have the same standard of living. Now, why is this happening? Is this because we have lots of greedy businessmen? Now, many people think that, but unfortunately, things are not always as they seem. Uh, the fact that the rose smells better than the cabbage doesn't mean it makes better soup also. Unfortunately, people come to certain conclusions when they look at things, and sometimes those conclusions are wrong. Now, who determines prices? If businessmen can determine prices, how come businessmen go bankrupt every now and again? Surely if you could determine your own price, you would just put up your price and you'll make more profit. The fact that many businessmen do go bankrupt 
surely must indicate to us that they cannot determine the price of their commodities. Uh, price formation is like a big auction that's happening all the time. Uh, businessmen are trying to sell their products and what they do is, like in an auction, when you go to a cattle auction, somebody walks around and says, who will give me a bid? When you go into a shop and somebody has a price on a commodity, he's in fact saying to you, who will give me a bid? And the moment you take your money out of your pocket, you are in fact giving him a bid. And if he doesn't get any bids, he'll have to reduce his price. The fact that you sometimes enter a shop and you already see there's a price and you negotiate with a shop owner and he says, sorry buddy, I'm not going to lower my price, only means that there are some other people who are willing to pay that bid. And that's why he can put that price there. In a free society, as you heard, in a free market uh, society, consumers are in fact determining prices by their selling and refraining from selling. It's like a voting process. You vote with your money. And if enough people vote for a certain commodity, that commodity will uh, be produced, etc. That person who produces the commodity will make money. And if he makes a big profit, somebody else will come in there to take part in this nice little game of making money. But if you come in and you want to have customers buy from you, there's only one way you can do it. You have to lower your price. Now, people think prices can never come down. But there was a period in history, in England for example, from uh, 1800 to 1900, where prices dropped by approximately 1% a year. In America, during the same period, prices came down by 40% in the time of the so-called robber barons. Now were those people then less greedy than we are now? In Germany, for example, in the 20s, prices went up daily. Were those businessmen getting greedier by the day? Or what, what, uh, what was the reason for that? In Argentina, prices go up faster than South Africa. Are Argentinian businessmen greedier than South Africans? And in Switzerland, when, where prices go up slower, are those people less greedy than South Africans? It's obvious that you cannot explain rising prices by greed. Now, an important point that we have to remember is that people normally act in their own self-interest. Now that is the way of the world. By itself, it may not be a very good characteristic, but if you combine it with one single rule, it becomes a very good thing. And that one single rule is the basis of a free market. You are not allowed to use force or fraud. That is the basis of a free market. Once you combine that rule with self-interest, then you will find that people can only act in their own self-interest if they act in somebody else's self-interest at the same time. Old Adam Smith, he uh, wrote about it and uh, he said the following, It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love and never talk to them of their own necessities, but of their advantages. If you look around you, you see lots of uh, uh, banners here. What are those people saying to you? They say, please, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, come to me. I've got the best thing on the market. But they can't use guns and dogs to get you into the shops. You have to go in there on your own accord. They have to seduce you. In fact, a businessman must treat his customers like his girlfriend and not like his wife. <laughs> he can never, never take them for granted. In fact, a businessman, he knows that you can uh, cut somebody's hair many times, but you can scalp him only once. <laughs> and that is really the driving force of, of businesses. And if that is true, you can only stay in business if you continually have either a better product or a cheaper product. So in a real free enterprise society, prices should be going down all the time. And the question is, why not? How come that it doesn't happen? And the reason for this, we have to find in our monetary system. It has nothing to do with greed. Now, to understand how that works, one has to look at money. 
Now, money is a, it's a funny thing, you know. Some people say it's the only way we stay in touch with our kids. But it's important, it's the lifeblood of society. And it's something that developed over a long period. You know, at one stage, people exchange with each other by exchanging one commodity for another commodity. It was called direct exchange. But it was very inconvenient. What happened if you uh, had a cow and you wanted, uh, you know, uh, a shirt, for example, some tobacco, a little bit of this and a little bit of that? Where will you find people who had all those things who would want to share a cow? It was virtually impossible. So what people did, over the centuries, they tried to find something that everybody wanted in exchange. A commodity that was acceptable to most people. But what is such a commodity? First of all, it, it couldn't be tomatoes. Tomatoes would only last for a few days. It had to last. It had to be divisible. It had to be scarce. And eventually the commodities that developed were in fact silver and gold and some things like salt every now and again. They became money. Money is a commodity that everybody wants to uh, take in exchange. Now, unfortunately, money, something that you uh, use like gold, was sometimes cumbersome to carry with you. The result of that was that people stored their money in warehouses that eventually became known as banks, and they got, got receipts for the money there. Today, we use those receipts and we call them banknotes. We think that the banknotes are in fact the money, but it wasn't like that always. The banknote was just a receipt for something. That's why some of the old banknotes were called things like a pound. A pound note meant that you could get a pound of silver in weight for that piece of paper. But the money was the silver, not the piece of paper. Now, today we still have that fiction. If you uh, look at your, uh, any note, no, nowadays you can't afford to carry notes around anymore, but it still has the fiction that says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand at Pretoria, and of course then comes the catch. It doesn't say gold or silver. It says 10 rand or 20 rand. And if you go there and you say to the governor of the Reserve Bank, I see you've signed here this document, can I please have the goodies? For a 10 rand note, you'll get two 5 rand notes, or five 2 rand notes. <laughs> but you won't get the real money anymore. And that is where inflation starts. What happened was, in the old days, the people who were now uh, the storers, who had the warehouses for gold, they would issue more receipts than they had money. And when somebody got a bit worried about his gold there, he would quickly go and exchange his uh, paper back for the gold, word would get around, there would be a rush on this uh, store, this warehouse for money, and they would run out of gold. It was called a run on the bank. Then governments changed the laws, and they said from now on it couldn't be done anymore. And the reason for that, of course, was that governments themselves borrowed this money from those banks. And they gave it a very fancy new name, they called it the fractional reserve banking system, which means you only have to keep a little bit of the real goodies there and you can issue a lot of other pieces of paper. Now, to see how inflation works, one can just imagine a society where we use gold. Now, say, for example, we have small little gold coins the size of a five-cent piece, and say, for example, the price of a suit is five of these little pieces. If somebody wants to sell a suit for ten of those pieces of gold, the consumers would probably say, no, thank you, we can get it somewhere else for five of those pieces. But what happens now if you can invent a little machine that makes gold from seawater? A little electronic gadget. You just pour seawater in the one side and out the other side comes a little five cent coins. After a while, these five cent coins will be all over the place. If you were now somebody selling that suit, would you still stake five of those little coins for the suit? Never in your life. You would now want more. And that is in fact what inflation is. Inflation is caused basically by an increase in the money supply. And businessmen have nothing to do with that. They can't control that in any way. And unfortunately, the, base, the culprits here are mostly governments. Governments all over the world, they have control of the money supply. And that's what they do, and they increase it. And the question is why? Why would governments do that? reason for that again is very simple. 
and in a way we are to blame for it ourselves. You know, we want government to do all kinds of things for us. We want them to give us nice roads, free education, subsidized medical care, and lots of other things. But we don't want to pay for it. And of course, governments are aware of that. So they are not so keen to put up taxes, because then people will go and vote somewhere else. So what they do is, they spend more than they take in through taxes. They have what is called a deficit, a budget deficit. Now, where do they get this difference between what they spend and what they get from taxes? They borrow it. And it's this borrowing process which works exactly like in the old days. When governments then borrowed from banks, the banks gave them pieces of paper and they issued lots and lots of pieces of paper and that caused inflation in old times. It's exactly the same today. When gov governments borrow, the government borrowing is translated into an increase in the money supply in the economy. It's called to monetize the state debt, and that causes inflation. In South Africa, there has been roughly an eight-fold increase in the money supply from, I think, 1970 till now. That's why you have roughly an eight to ten-fold increase in prices. It's got nothing to do with the petrol price, increase in the petrol price. It's got nothing to do with the extra demand for wages by trade unions. Those are all consequences of inflation, not the cause of inflation. Inflation is caused by one thing and one thing only, and that's by an increase in the money supply. Demand pull and cost push inflation that economists sometimes talk about is just different manifestations of this. Economists are a funny lot. They never seem to agree. They say if you take all the economists in the world and you put them end to end, they'll point in all directions. <laughs> now, it's true about inflation also. You never hear somebody come out on TV and stating openly, look, inflation is caused by an increase in the money supply. It's not caused by greedy businessmen. Now, we all have dreams of a better future for us and for our kids, of a free society in South Africa, but if we want to make our dreams come true, we have to wake up. We have to inform people more and more about the realities of economics about what causes things like inflation, about what is the best way to have a better future in South Africa. The best way to do it is to have a free economy, as you've heard from uh, people before, from Iso Yanana. It gives power to consumers. It gives them options. If you have a free, deregulated society, there are more options. There are more people entering, offering their, your, their goodies. There's only one way that they can make a living. They must offer you a better goodie at a cheaper price than the next year. Otherwise, why will you vote for them with your money? Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Now we have questions, and um, I see they here. Sorry, Madam Chair, I don't want to hog the morning, but there's some things I just have to react to. Um, Mr. Swanepoel, the gist of what I understood was that businessmen are not really greedy. We're stuck in an inflationary time, and I think that's a bit simplistic because we're printing more money because we have to pay things like meat boards and dairy boards, etc., etc. We can't simply overlook that. That's the one point. The other point that I'd like to make is, is this. I don't see any paper in particular directed to this. We've heard this morning that in order to be able to get the benefits of good consumerism, we need a free market. This means comp Competition must be free and it must be open. But nobody has stressed the fact, and this ties in, I think, with your subject, that competition has to be fair. If competition is not fair, it means that you've got deception and unconscionability in the marketplace. And this is something that you can't just simplistically dump by, by the wayside. I think that there are a lot of greedy businessmen around. 
And I think they're quite right to be greedy because they must succeed. And I don't condemn anybody for being greedy. I think they should all be greedy. But what the point is, what the crux is, is that there's a certain cutoff point where greed disintegrates into becoming deceptive and unconscionable. There's a certain cutoff point where greed is manipulated and the public is manipulated. You know, we, we recognize puffing or boasting in advertising. We sell the best car in the world. Most reasonable people know that that is empty words and we are still buy a car of our choice and test it and so on. But there are people who are going beyond this. Mrs. Matlana this morning came with a uh, statement. Excuse me, will you be asking a question because we haven't got a lot of time for questions. Right. Could I ask Mr. Swanepoel, did he take unconscionability and deception of businessmen into account? And could he answer me with reference to Mrs. McLana's statement this morning about people who sign contracts they can't read, not only because they are illiterate, but very often because the print is so small that you cannot read it anyway? Thank you. Okay, there are quite a few questions there. First of all, we agree that people are greedy. But we say that the free enterprise utilizes that greed for the benefit of society by bringing in a rule. And the rule says you're not allowed to use force or fraud. And this uh, the kind of actions that we've just uh, heard about are actions which in fact are fraudulent. And in terms of ordinary common law, you can act on those actions. The problem is not the law, the problem is access to the law. And as uh, Louis Tega and Leon Lowe have uh, pointed out, the problem is how to get to the law. It's no good making a new law to protect people. You must give them access, easy access to the existing law. The other thing, of course, is that illiterate people are not stupid. If we want to uh, protect people against themselves, eventually you'll have a nation of sheep. It's I'd only like because... To one minute, if I may. Mr. Tehran, could you go to the registration desk immediately, please? Uh, as regard to the question of fairness, the word fair is a very difficult word to, uh, to, to say what it is. It's like the word pornography. <laughs> pornography, they say, is anything that gives a judge an erection. Now, how do you define fair? Fair is a very difficult word to define. We say as long as you have a law that says you're not allowed to use force or fraud, then people are protected. And as long as you have laws that protect them in that respect. And the common law does that. We must have access to the law. Thank you. I've got um, here a question. Sorry. If increasing the money supply is the cause of inflation, what is the solution to inflation? Well, the, the first of all solution is one mustn't uh, increase the money supply. And the only way you can achieve that is for the government to balance its budget. It must never spend more than the takes in through taxes. Now that in itself is a mouthful. Uh, to get governments to do that, there's a very nice way of saying it, I won't say it yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In Afrikaans they say I'm it's in a hook fast to kill with a no kitty. It's the same with the, with the government. It's very difficult to do that unless one has constitutional limitations saying that the government is not allowed to do that. You will find that the democratic process itself will tend to force politicians in that direction because that's the only way they stay in power, by buying votes. And the way that you buy votes is by selling favors. And unfortunately you have to pay for those favors. It's very difficult, but it can be done. Thank you. Back there, as short as you can, we're running out of time, please. Oh, uh, yes. Could, could you go to the microphone, please? Would it not help if we were allowed to use American money? Instead of South African money. Yeah. <laughs> Short and sweet. The, uh, the answer is, is, is quite true. If we were to privatize the monetary system, then uh, 
we could solve that problem also because then you'll have competing monies and the money system that does not inflate will be the chosen one. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's a concept that's probably a bit strange to most people, although there are many economists who are promoting that idea at the moment. Thank you. I'll take one more question, please. At the back, I guess. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Sonic, perhaps uh, it's not right to direct to you uh, personally. Uh, one is troubled by the ambivalence that has been shown by South Africa's corporate world in that, uh, as you said earlier on, the business world is not responsible for the rising prices. It is the uh, money supply that is causing of the troubles that we found in this country. So, uh, I would like your comment that do you agree with uh, Zante Pierre and his two colleagues that the government is mismanaging the economy and do you also agree that our corporate world, that is South Africa, is ambivalent to the extent that we satisfy their own needs and forget uh, the majority of people of this country? Well, people in general satisfy their own needs wherever you may be, whether you're a consumer or a businessman. It's only in a free market society that you are forced by the situation to act in the self-interest of other people. The fact that governments mismanage the economy, I don't know if, uh, you know, just changing the driver will make a, give a better result. What one must try and do is change the whole structure of government in the economy. Then it should be more independent of the driver. At the moment, it depends too much on the driver. The driver can be bribed and uh, he can be cajoled into all, doing all kinds of things and that eventually will lead to inflation. Uh, we have to change the structure of the whole governmental process. Thank you, Mr. Swanepoel. Uh, now, thank you I'd now like to call on Mr. Dan Leach. He's a senior lecturer in finance and industrial economics at FITS. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics from the University of Pennsylvania in the United States and a doctorate in economics in the University of California at Los Angeles. 